have two authors that we've been trying to get for a while, frankly. And uh, one of them is Brian Dirk, who is a professor of history at Anderson University in Indiana, receiving his master's from Rice University, his doctorate from the University of Kansas. He's the author of eight books, including Lincoln and the Constitution, Lincoln the Lawyer, which won the very prestigious Baroness Lincoln Award from the New York Civil War Roundtable. He also wrote Abraham Lincoln in White America, Lincoln, Indiana, for the concise Lincoln Library uh, series. And he's written numerous articles and given speeches from the National Archives and Harvard University to the Lincoln Forum and Gettysburg Civil War Institute. His latest book, the one you're here for, is The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death. It's Southern Illinois University Press, 228 pages, illustrated, and is $29.50. We also have Brian Keller. Ron Keller, gosh. That's OK. If I can be associated just, with the Brian editing. I just elided you that's, together. No, that's thank wonderful. You. Thank I thought it was one person schizophrenic. <laughs> at, so Ron Keller at Lincoln College in Lincoln, Illinois, an associate professor of history and political science. He's managing director of the Abraham Lincoln Center of Character Development and a past president of the Lincoln Heritage director, I should say, the Lincoln Heritage Museum at Lincoln College, a terrific place to stop by. If you're going to Springfield, get to Lincoln and see the Lincoln Heritage Museum. He's co-author of Abraham Lincoln in Logan County and wrote a respect for the office, Letters from the Presidents. His latest book, and again what you're here for, is Lincoln in the Illinois Legislature. Again, Southern Illinois University Press, a title in the Concise Lincoln Library series, 160 pages, illustrated, and is $24.95. And these are two books that are just packed with information. Thinnish, as books go, and we usually have them, but packed. You will love reading both of these. We curate these books. We try to get the best we can here for you. So even though I say every time it's a book you need, you do. You need them because we curate them. We try to get the best we can find. So I'm going to start out with you, Ron, uh, in researching the book. What became your best resources? Memoirs, letters, reminiscences, state records, all of the above? All of the above. Uh, certainly there's no source that you can, no stone that you can't and shouldn't uh, turn over to find what you can find. Um, because one of the things that Paul Simon did in 1965 when writing his book well was use the resources that were available. In the internet world when you have so much more that has been digitalized uh, and put online uh, and more that's available and known to be available, um, it, it, was, it was something I felt I needed to do to contact some of those sources that he did not use. I would suppose, though, probably two sources uh, rose above all. One is the obvious collected works of Abraham Lincoln, which we all go to, uh, and which I had read uh, thoroughly. But when researching Lincoln as an Illinois legislator, I think I had a very different view because I was attacking the sort of political mind of Lincoln and why he was doing what he was doing when writing the collected works. Um, as well, the, uh, the House Journal, uh, which is now online, uh, thanks to uh, several universities in the state of Illinois, uh, that is now all online. And these were invaluable. Um, a lot of time to take to pour through thousands and thousands of pages. But it is a, it's, it's right there. It's, it, instead of using a secondhand source, the House Journal was very invaluable from 1834 to 1842. Now, newspapers are now online. Newspapers are online, must have been and helpful. I should mention that as well. Um, and the unfortunate part of those kind of things is the newspapers that are available, because they, some have not survived through the years. Uh, I was hoping to find some of the original sources that I did not find. But nonetheless, many of those are also uh, online, including the Sangamo Journal, which, of course, reported very heavily on Lincoln as a uh, legislator. You mentioned Paul Simon, by the way. His, his staff, when he met, left the Senate, uh, had his going away party at our shop, our old shop. That's right. So yeah. that was very nice. That's great. Uh, just quickly, I want to ask you, since you talked about him, uh, he's the one who first covered the legislative years. Yes. Is it still useful? Oh, absolutely useful. Uh, I mean, yours is terrific. Absolutely useful. Um, and I really didn't set out. Paul Simon in 1965 did write Preparation for Greatness. Uh, it is the only single volume 
biography of Lincoln dedicated particularly singularly to that topic of Lincoln, Illinois legislature. Obviously, many others have written about it. Uh, Richard Miller did a four-volume set on Lincoln's life and included that in that set. Um, and, and I did not re out, set out to rehash Paul Simon. What I set out to do was to maybe look at, as I said, 50 years down the road, uh, took a look at, at Lincoln maybe differently than what he did considering the times. And we'll probably get into it later, so I won't talk about it now. But I did find that I did differ with Paul Simon. Yeah, I, um, that's a question I had. You yeah. come to different conclusions. I, As I, you're talking, I, I, I you did, let's do I that. did. Uh, and, and I can address that now if you'd like. But What in particular, briefly, what in particular? Yeah, okay, so the, the biggest difference I felt I had was uh, Paul Simon, and I was a little surprised, um, Paul Simon, who was a great U.S. senator as well as a historian um, and dedicated his life to public service, um, perhaps had this love for Lincoln that, um, I don't want to use the word naive, but I think I'm going to, um, because I was a little surprised by how Paul Simon felt that perhaps Lincoln was above the political game. Lincoln was a political animal. You know, he played the political game. Amen. Uh, and it's particularly about two particular votes, which the Long Nine and he wanted to get passed were the removal of the capital from Vandalia to Springfield, as well as the internal improvements, which of course there was a fever guns. pitch for internal improvements. A and the Long Nine, the Sangamon County delegation, wanted to get both of these at the same time. Paul Simon contends, by looking at the votes, there was no tit for tat, no quid pro quo. I hate to use that term in modern political uh, <laughs> terms now, but um, you know, that he looked at the votes and said, there was not pressure put on to vote for this, for that. And I'm thinking, if you look at actually at the lot of votes, he's right. But you, it's naive to think that there wasn't pressure that, to put on some of these to vote for that. And, and in fact, Lincoln himself talked about how he gave away all he had. And Thomas Ford, uh, who wrote a great history of Illinois, uh, talked about log rolling and said the long nine rolled like a snowball. And, <laughs> we'll uh, get into that. Okay. We're get all into right. That. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Brian, because uh, I want to find your about your approach okay. to the book. You, of course, certainly approached, you know, it's death and death in Lincoln's <laughs> life, which we've never seen before. And you appropriately uh, approach the subject as an historian. Hmm. But did you have to research the psychological aspects? How did you do that? Did you consult any deathologists? <laughs> uh, what did you do? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I think anyone who writes about um, an individual like Lincoln must take into account psychology. Um, I, but I like always to do it with a bit of a light touch. Um, I don't want to get too deeply into Freudian psychoanalytical. I'm not even qualified to do that, and it's not all that useful. Uh, my model for this is um, one of my absolute favorite books on Lincoln is uh, Michael Burlingame's um, The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln. I thought, I thought Michael did an outstanding job of applying psychological theory, but with a plausible touch. So I try not to get too deeply into esoteric theories of what death meant. I, I was much more interested in culture. I was interested in how people at the time that Lincoln was alive dealt with death, how they ritualized funerals, how they ritualized mourning, and the cultural tools that he had. Well, tell us about the cultural, the, the what should I say, the, the death culture <laughs> in America mm. at that time, in Victorian times. Oh, yeah. uh, there were certainly social prescriptions, rituals, oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. Lincoln knew of them. Tell us oh, about yeah. that. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, modern Americans, we just, we really don't get just, I, I almost... Death as far away. I mean, yeah, there yeah, yeah. it was in your home. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, yeah. I hate to use the word obsessed, but I'm going to use it, okay? I mean, I, I think obsessive is not too strong a term for people who, yes, death was in their, in, in, in their very living, literally in their living rooms. Most people died at home. There is no modern uh, funeral directory industry to get between you and the dying. Uh, you know, people experienced the death very intimately, very directly, and they had very prescribed rules, especially among you know, up and coming professional middle class Americans like Lincoln, like what he was in the 1840s and 50s. This is a lawyer on the make, a politician on the make. He wants to be a respectable middling class denizen of Springfield. And when, I talk about this in my book, when his son Eddie dies, 
Um, he follows the rules to the letter, the proper funeral, the proper mourning rituals. Um, and I should add as well, Mary did as well. Mary, there's no indication this early on that Mary was in any way unbalanced or unstable. They knew what the rules were and they followed him as far as I can tell to the Well, letter. wouldn't Mary have known those rules oh, absolutely. better than Lincoln? I think that's a good he point. He came through, oh, absolutely. didn't have rules out there oh, in the wilderness. Absolutely, and one of the points I make in the first chapter of the book is Lincoln first experienced the death with the death of his mother and then the death of his sister and then the death of Ann Rutledge and then I even talked a little bit about how he experienced the death on the frontier with things like hunting and it's a very raw, very unfiltered thing and you know the, the rules are very much simpler if there are any and you know he's he's experiencing death literally in, in the dirt, in the mud, in the muck of the frontier. When he goes to Springfield and he is becoming a professional, it's a totally different story. He needs to get the headstone right, he needs to get the hymns right, he needs to get everything properly So placed. he had Mary there to help him, he did. not others, he did. I presume. He did. I made a list of death in Lincoln's life. <laughs> That's a long list. <laughs> his mother in 1818, yes, his yes. sister in 1826. Mm -hmm. He killed the turkey. Yeah, he killed the turkey. Mm -hmm. I like the turkey. Yep. 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 Burying yep. soldiers in the Black Hawk War yes. in 1832. Yes. There were five of them there, yes. now 12 yep. Yep. later. <laughs> You mentioned Ann Rutledge in mm -hmm. 1835, Eddie mm -hmm. in 1850, mm -hmm. Willie in 1863, yep. the Gettysburg Cemetery that he yep. went to, visiting hospitals, yep. viewing bodies oh. on the battlefield, mm -hmm. oh God, yes. and of course, 20,000 minimum military commissions oh. Oh, yeah. that he wrote beautifully his oh, hand yeah. each time Oh yeah, because he knew he was sending someone perhaps to his death exactly. for this country. Exactly. That's a lot of death. A lot of death, yeah. It's, it's not really though, I mean, it's unusual for the president, it's the presidential one that oh, really brings it up, but absolutely. beforehand, it's much the same as anyone. My feeling is that, I, I always hate to apply the word typical to someone like Abraham Lincoln, but I don't think he saw any more death and dying than your average American of the time, because after all, the child mortality rates are much higher, uh, life expectancy is much lower. Uh, yes, he did see death in multiple places, but and it's hard to say because how do you quantify that? You know, but my impression is yes, he did see quite a bit of death and dying. I won't say he it was extraordinary until the war broke out. Yeah, Absolutely. and then it positively Absolutely. was. Absolutely. And even early on in the Civil War, uh, am I correct that the first officer to die in the Civil War was Elmer Ellsworth? Oh, which Absolutely. Which like a surrogate son, right? Yes, so Absolutely. I think Eddie Baker, right very soon Eddie Baker just falls off just a and year Baker. later, and right? Baker. So he I think named it, Eddie. Yeah, Baker. so it became Absolutely. very, very personal very, very Abs fast. Absolutely. In fact, um, I mean, Lincoln personally um, arranged Ellsworth's funeral. Right, um, right. He was laid in state in the White House, which right. is what you did for, for you know ambassadors and presidents and that kind of thing. He was very deep in that. And, and, and the death of Edward Baker um, very much, um, very much affected him tremendously. Right. Yeah. Now, in your book, Ron, uh, there's death as well, by the way, and maybe we'll touch on that as we go through. But you, you really talk about the 1850s. Uh, that's what we all talk about as being the growth years for Lincoln. But you're saying that really he had growth years earlier that we didn't really look at until your book uh, during, during the legislative years. These were just as important to Lincoln's growth, you argue. So in what manner was that growth broadly? Yeah, uh, if, if I can say yes, one uh, beef I have oftentimes with historians as they lay out Lincoln's political development, or just his development in general, uh, is the fact that these legislative years are discounted, they're overlooked. Uh, and certainly, uh, he enters the legislature as a young man. And so, um, and, and, I, and we'll probably get into this about the character and the things that he does develop, uh, but uh, certainly and he makes mistakes as a young man and at age 25, because he's very wet behind the ears, he's from the frontier, uh, and he's certainly not someone who has a great amount of demeanor and, and all of those things, so he has to develop that. But in just those four terms, he goes from being a political upstart, no political career, uh, someone who is certainly unafraid to um, bash his opponents through the newspaper, um, by the time he leaves the legislature in 1842, he has developed uh, policy making, um, intellect, uh, he becomes more of a wordsmith, uh, he, he is someone who has developed some personal connections with people who he would have the rest of his life. Um, and, and I often, when I t give talks and Guy Fraker, who wrote the Lincoln's Ladder of the Presidency about the, uh, the law career, and who says uh, it was the law career that developed Lincoln, I have to say, 
Can I put alongside that the uh, as he's developing his law career, he's also a legislator, mm -hmm. and because these connections that he makes on the frontier are the some of the same connections he makes um, in the legislature. I mean, let's keep in mind John Stewart is is a. Uh, his law attorney was the man who mentored him and shaped him to become the legislator that he was. So uh, he developed a lot of those kind of things by the 1850s, as you say. He had he had developed those in the 1830s. Well, who were some of those uh, uh, friends that he made at the time, colleagues? Uh, he, he met a large number of people there. Which ones were the most particularly important to him Got going it. forward? You've already talked about Jerry Sly, who is John Stewart, and um, also Orville Browning and his wife Eliza, mm -hmm. whom he got very close to. Yes. Eliza. Yes. Uh, those were two certainly yes. that helped him going forward. No. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And I wish I had more time in that book because it's concise to develop and, and really look at those personal relationships. Uh, but certainly those were two, uh, and you're right, Orville Browning was more of Eliza Browning. Uh, but there's also, uh, w you know, William Fithian, uh, there is um, Jesse Du Bois, and, and Jesse Du Bois is actually one of those I like to, I really wish I could have looked at more, because I think they had a lot in common. They were both young. Uh, they were both in many ways articulate, articulate very logical in their thinking approach. Uh, and Jesse Du Bois was someone who had this vision of greater Illinois, like many of them did. Um, uh, and uh, Lincoln didn't talk much about these conversations, nor did he talk much about the personal relationships, which I lament. Um, but uh, certainly those are the kind of people that uh, definitely were very formative in the legislature, but also afterwards as well. And many of these people would also become important campaigning for him in 1858 for the Senate, as well as the presidency in 1860. And uh, another that was there was Perhaps a nemesis, Usher Linder. Usher Linder, yeah. yeah, yeah. He got, he's in your war. Uh, yeah, in your I, book. I, I just I love Usher Linder, uh, and I, and Usher Linder. Lincoln had said um, that uh, Usher Linder liked to talk because he loved to hear himself talk, <laughs> uh, which of course get in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unlike a lot of politicians, no uh, mm -hmm. and certainly they sparred greatly uh, and greatly over the bank debate was probably their, their biggest uh, debate. But it's interesting because even Usher Linder, uh, who later in the Civil War, when his son became a, a a confederate and was, if, if I'm, if I've captured as a spy, if I'm correct on this, uh, because they didn't go into that detail necessarily, but he reached out to Lincoln for help and Lincoln uh, helped him because, again, there was this sense of respect that they had. Now, you know, let's, let's talk about death for a moment in your book, and, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, Brian, too, because there were a couple of deaths that occurred just before and during, and we're talking about uh, Mary Owens, and we're talking about Ann Rutledge. I happen to have an Edgar Lee Masters poem from 1940 on Ann Rutledge. Uh, he starts out, uh, out of me unworthy and unknown, the vibrations of deathless music, with malice toward none, with charity for all. He goes on to say, I am Ann Rutledge who slept beneath the weeds, beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. So how did those affect him during the legislative years? He's, he had that depressive character, we know that. Yeah, he did, he did. And certainly the death of Ann Rutledge came at a crucial time in his life um, in 1835 when he was just, it was his first term. Uh, and uh, we do begin to see the depression the melancholy, the hypo, uh, all those terms for it, began to really affect him greatly in those particular time periods. Um, and, and in a way, I think this is why I think that it's great for Lincoln that he had the legislature because he also, in his first term, was becoming the politician, as we said, that he would become. But I think that gave him the sense of hope, that gave him, uh, for that period of life, it wouldn't be as easy to get out of, it seems, as, as after the breakup of Mary, uh, Mary Todd in 1841 when he disappeared from the legislature for a while. <clears throat> um, I think he seemed to have this, this hope that maybe I, I could go to the legislature, I could make something of myself. He really had this ambition and that thankfully was why I think what gave him maybe, if, if I can be so bold to say, a will to live in response oh, to Oh, I think you're death. positively right and, I, and thinking about it now when you're saying this, how important the legislator, uh, legislative years were to his 
ultimate goal yes. to make something of himself Absolutely. before yes. he died. Yes. And I think positively that kept him away from the depression yes. that he got himself into, that I've got to get out of this to do something. And the legislature gave him a, a stepping stone. I didn't mm -hmm. really think about that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, did the culture of death that permeated the Victorian times, uh, the funereal movement, well, I was going to talk about that later, mm -hmm. did that mask Lincoln a bit, his depression? Mm, it could have, it very, very well could have. Um, especially with, um, with, with Anne Rutledge, and, and you, you all know this, the sources are ambiguous, I think is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I know, for example, David Donald wrestled back and forth with whether or not they even had a relationship. I know, he kind of went one way and the other. Um, I believe, from what I saw of Lincoln's reaction to his mother's death, um, and to his sister's death, and I write this in my book, he had a tendency to internalize and suppress his grief um, yeah. because there are very few right. descriptions of him with back of losing it. You know, he, 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 there's nothing about his reaction to his mother's death, nothing at all. And then with his sister, there's a description of him sitting on a log and crying, but that's totally understandable. So he's not exactly, you know, coming unglued. There's all kinds of rumors of him coming unglued about Ann Rutledge's death. Unfortunately, a lot of those sources, they may be true, they may not be. It's very difficult to tell. And some of this is so swathed in the sort of the syrupy sentimentality of the age. There was one source I found that said Lincoln never carried a pocket knife for the rest of his life yeah, because no. he's afraid he would suddenly injure himself. Well, yeah, guess what? He had no. a pocket knife in his pocket, not even shot. We know this, okay? You know, so you have to pull all that back. So what you're left with with Ann Rutledge, I believe, is yes, I think they had a relationship because there's just too many multiple sources to suggest there's nothing there at all. On the other hand, I suspect he probably internalized his grief over Anne much the same way he did with his mother, you know, and I think that's how he dealt with it. I didn't want, I didn't want mean to, by the way, that o, uh, Mary Owens died, just that it, that was almost like a death to yeah. me for him. Sure, sure. But his father, mm -hmm. there was a death in his life oh, that, yes. that he really suppressed. But you yes. know what? I'm thinking about this, too. He suppressed his character. Mm -hmm. All of his friends say we had him surrounded. We didn't know what he really exactly. felt. Exactly. So yeah. death was inside him as yes. well as, yes. high, as, yeah. as as much as yeah. his character to his friends. In an age when people talked about death in openly emotional, romantic, sentimental terms, Lincoln is striking mm -hmm. for his absence of these expressions. He almost never talks about heaven. He almost never talks about the afterlife. We all know his religious life was at best ambivalent. Yeah, I, I do not believe that um, he, he saw death as the, what Drew Gilpin Faust called the good death, the sentimentalism of the deathbed scene of, you know, I'm going to go to heaven someday. That just wasn't the way he dealt with these issues at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got, I've, there's so much that I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to say all at once, but uh, let, let me go to the Lincoln Berry store for a moment, because that's kind of a beginning. And I happen to have here, just happen to have, <laughs> the only Black Hawk War-related piece still extant in private hands. And here he is with a very different type of signature. Maybe we can put this up later afterwards and post uh, that uh, this is where he is in January of 33, and he is obtaining his money, his pay, for being in the Black Hawk War. This is the same month now that he and Barry came together for a store and, signed, and had a contract to do that. Might the money that have come from his pay gone to the store? Uh, I would I would assume so, yes. Uh, I always wonder where did it come from? Sure, all of a sudden sure. I'm thinking about that. Sure, I would assume so, yeah. I'm, yeah. And I'm, I'm certain there are many things that are going on in his life because, again, working in the legislature, this is the same year that the Black Hawk War breaks out that he, he makes his first run for the legislature, which, of course, he loses, which I, I would contend is probably one of the best things that happened to him uh, because I don't think he was really ready in many ways for that legislature term that we, he would have be more ready for in 1834. Now, tell me, did the, how do I want to say, uh, the acumen in building the Lincoln Berry store, did that help him get chair of the finance committee? How the hell did that happen? Uh, 
It, my understanding is uh, is that it's a committee that very few people wanted. So uh, as a freshman legislator, he was sort of put on that particular role. It was not ideal. It's not one that he was particularly good at, uh, to be honest. Uh, and in fact, I contend in the book, William Herndon even said uh, that Lincoln is a man who had little money since. Uh, so to be on the finance committee uh, was, was, again, just sort of a, a lowbrow job that you had and that was the only committee he was on for the first term. So, hmm. Now in 36, 1836, Everything uh, changed. speaking of money, but during that year he purchased two lots of land in Springfield. Where did that money come from? Was he stealing hubcaps? I mean horseshoes? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, sure, Dan. Uh, that's a subject of my next book. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I don't really know. Uh, I really do not know the answer to that question. So, yeah. Because there's money going out for the store, and then yeah. all of a sudden, two lots of, yeah. of land. I, so, I, I really uh, don't know. I was just kind of curious. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a good question. It's actually a very relevant question. I've been asked that before, so maybe I should, I should look into that. It will be part two. Tell me about Knox's mortality. You have oh. a a sign, a, a written out manuscript in Lincoln's hands uh, signed in the museum of mortality by Knox. Yes, yes. That was given years ago and uh, there it was. What was that to him? He, ra he made it two or three times he wrote it out. What was that for him? It was by far his most favorite poem. If you read the poem, it is written by a, a dour Scotsman with all of the overtones of sort of dreary darkness in some ways. I believe it expressed for Lincoln his belief in the ultimate unknowability of death because if you read that poem, you know, it is an expression of sort of a bleak, you know, no matter what we do, we will die and nobody really knows exactly why that is so. Um, I think it expressed Lincoln's fatalism, which uh, I think yep. was embedded in him all the way back for his days as a hard shell Baptist growing up in Indiana. So, oh, yeah. I agree. So what, of course, was his view of death? We look through death uh, through different lenses through our lives. We all do. So how did he view him as a reader and poet, mm -hmm. uh, especially of Shakespeare, a, a reader, as a lawyer and professional politician? He looked at death differently, did he not? Mm -hmm. Especially through Blackstone's commentaries. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get to Henry Clay's eulogy. But let's, <laughs> how did he look through it in those first? Well. From a purely spiritual sense, I believe he saw death as an ultimate mystery. Um, basically, people die, God has a plan behind the death, but you know, Lincoln would have said, I don't know what it is and I'm not going to pretend to speculate. Now, Herndon says, I could never draw him into conversations about metaphysics because he dismissed them as scientific absurdities and mere trash. So there is a acceptance of an unknowability to death in his tastes in um, religion and poetry. I argued that the law practice, though, told him that the law could be something you could emotionally separate yourself from, because he had a great many cases that had death either directly or indirectly involved. You know, obvious ones like, you know, the Armstrong murder case, uh, probate cases, all that sort of thing. Blackstone and the law teaches him that you, you sometimes have to separate emotionally from death. Death can be, for lack of a better term, a tool. You know, it can be a uh, you know a problem to be solved. You know, death of a business partner, for example, creates a dissolution issue that he has to litigate. Death can be the solution to a problem. You execute a prisoner for a murder, whatever. But you you have to get an emotional distance from death to be able to make it work properly. Well, that went to uh, Henry Clay's eulogy, which I talked about. Um, mm. His political idol, mm -hmm. and there he was. He wrote that, as you say. Lincoln, the politician, made professional use of death in this eulogy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So should that be provocative? I, I try not to be. In fact, I said this. I'm not, I'm not being cynical. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not trying to be cynical. You know, because I thought I was going to write. I wrote that and I was like, oh my, people are going to think he was like manipulating the death of this person. I don't believe that's true at all. What I was getting into there was the, for lack of a better term, the political uses of death. Um, and, you know, you know, political martyrdom like John Brown, for example. Um, the, the politics of death. That, you know, death, death was often used by uh, political extremists like the abolitionists and the John Brown legacy. Lincoln wouldn't go that far. But he understood that when it was time for him to write a eulogy of Henry Clay, that this was a political act, that it was an act that could be used for him as sort of part of his general coming out of 
kind of retirement because you know the, the, the clay eulogy occurs right around the time of the Peoria speech. I mean, was it two years before? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's Lincoln reemerging yes. after the mess of his congressional term. And I believe that he understood that people would listen to his opinions, Lincoln's opinions, about things like slavery and the Union if they were piggybacked onto the death of the great Henry Clay. And how, did a, they, how did they view that eulogy afterward? You know, as far as I can tell, I've not seen too many reactions to it. Have you, Ron? No, I have not. He, no, I have not. he, 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 he gave it. it obviously had great personal meaning to him. Um, right. Clay was his beau ideal of a statesman. It was disseminated, I'm sure, in the newspapers, but I've seen very little of anyone noticing it, mostly because Lincoln, although he is a well-known political leader in Illinois, isn't uh, he isn't president yet, so he's not, uh, you know, somebody that's going to show up in all the newspapers, and everybody had something to say about Henry Clay's death because he was a great statesman who died at that time. I think it had great meaning for him personally to be able to say, you know, because if, if you read it, it's, it's, it's like a quintessential moderate view on slavery. You know, I, I, I believe, like Henry Clay, that the Southerners are not bad, that we need to find a solution, colonization, all of that. And if he can, if he can get Henry Clay's legacy, that, that strengthens his own political legacy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So he's using the mantle of Clay. I, a bit. I, I would believe so. I oh, believe so. Okay. Absolutely. Now, of course, you know, uh, the Jesuits say, give me the child and I have the adult. Right. So Calvinism. Mm. Seems to be the same thing with Lincoln. You mentioned sure. fatalism. Absolutely. That imbued him for the rest of his life. It yes? certainly did. And um, I believe, and, and, and Ronnie Price be to this known Lincoln as well. I mean, there, there's always a, a, a quality of, of unknowability for things spiritual in Lincoln. That's why it's so hard to pin him down yeah, on religion. Right. It's so mm -hmm. difficult for him to do this because you look at him during the war. Unlike his counterpart, Jefferson Davis, he never tells anybody, I know what God wants. Mm -hmm. Davis is that all the time. Davis is like, God wants a Confederate victory. Of course, you can prove it wrong, okay? But, but God, you know, he, I know what God wants. But Lincoln never says it. He always, look at the second inaugural. He says, with firmness in the yeah. right, yeah. as God gives us to, to see, see the right, right he qualifies yeah. things. There was always a degree of, I think, humility that I'm not going to tell you I know what God wants, and I'm certainly not going to tell you what God meant for this death or that death or, for that matter, 700,000 soldiers' death. I think I know. I'm just not really sure. Well, way, he, I'm sorry. well, I was just going to say, even even second inaugural, you even say God cannot be on both sides exactly. at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 yeah, very much so. Yeah. God is on every side. Yeah. Yeah. He's the, every, we yeah. all... We all we pray to the yet. same God. Yeah. And we have all sinned. So what does yeah. that mean? Exactly. How can he be on our side or this side exactly. or want the, the Chicago Cubs to win? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't see it. And we see him grappling with that even, you know, in his run for the state legislature. I guess I was, I, I'd known, uh, of course, that he wasn't very much attracted to Enlightenment ideas. And, you know, we mm -hmm. hear about mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln sort of uh, just, just uh, uncertain, the fatalism and the uncertain about uh, God and mm -hmm. yeah, all that. But um, it, it was interesting coming across some people like the Matheny family who did not want to vote for Abraham Lincoln because they were afraid he wasn't a really a Christian. Mm -hmm. So even in his early years, he had faced a lot of that uncertainty about where he was in his spiritual walk. Right, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's truly true. Yeah. So getting back to uh, temporal affairs, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a total of 30 bills were introduced by Lincoln, right, between 34 yes, yes. and 1842. Out of some 1,600 all of so, yes. Wow. Was you know, what was their overall makeup for one, and uh, what percent passed? What percent pass? Well, uh, like today's politics, I mean, I, I didn't give an exact, I didn't figure out exact quotation about how many there would be, but uh, there were quite a few that did not, because Lincoln, many of his attempts did not. And it simply was because, um, like politics today, there's many different opinions and ideas, but Illinois is changing, and the idea of where Illinois should go definitely was, uh, was very, very different. Many of the bills that were proposed were for common things like uh, road petitions and bridge petitions and things like that were infrastructure-based. Um, and so, but there were also some petitions for, for uh, every time somebody wanted a divorce at that time period, they had to go through the state of Illinois to, to secure a divorce before it was eventually handed off to counties to take care of that. Um, he was and also very interested in the poor. Wasn't he in trying to oh, help absolutely, them? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and his first, his first bill he proposed was uh, to to limit the jurisdiction of the justices of the peace, because he had believed that his his national debt, which already because the Lincoln Berry store had already become um, a, a, just a weight on him, uh, he had. 
he had experienced the reality that what happened in that time period was that you went to a justice of the peace to settle your debt, but oftentimes these justice of the peace did not know these people. So they were brought in, so he wanted to ensure that there was a limit on the jurisdiction. So if you went before a, a magistrate or judge, you have the benefit of probably knowing who this person was who would give you a sense of, well, I know you have debt, I know you have creditors that you need to pay, but what we want to do is, is uh, I, I want to give you a break because I know who you are. And so actually that was one of the first things Lincoln did because he just believed, and I do believe he had a pulse on the common people and what they needed as frontier people at that particular time. Certainly when he entered the law, debt Indeed. cases were the majority, Indeed. 60 yeah. plus percent Indeed. perhaps. And he talks about that in his very first run for, uh, for, for public office where he talks about uh, you know, that the low interest rates and education and even dredging the Sangamon River will be all things that will help the common frontier man get his goods to market and will also increase his prosperity. Uh, so he was also a floor manager for the Whigs. Mm -hmm. So uh, was he a Lyndon Johnson or Sam Rayburn? How was he <laughs> oh as a floor manager for the first time? Uh, so the, the job really of the Whig floor leader, um, well, it's kind of like today the minority party. So what you do is try to get your party on the same page. You know you're not going to get legislation through. The Democratic Party held the majority. Um, and he did want to be speaker. Uh, he may have been speaker of the House had the Whigs been in control, but they were not. Um, so he had to settle for Whig floor leader. But it was to sort of corral your group of people like today it would be to corral your, your Whig party to, to be on the same page when it comes to legislation, which again is where I go back to my uh, saying the importance I think that the long night held politically in this time period was very, very important because not only were they Whigs, but they were also very much located in the central of the state, the, the biggest county in the state. So they had wielded a lot of political power. So it wasn't just being Whig floor leader as much as I think being where he was um, geographically located. Gotcha. Yeah, that was important. Sangamon County was Absolutely. had the most legislators there, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, percent. yes, indeed. Well, in his announcing for another term, uh, in June of 1836 in the Sangamo Journal, he seemed to be supporting women's suffrage. So there's this debate, uh, and I would want to hear both of your <laughs> thoughts on this because I've been asked this quite a bit. Uh, was he joking? Because Lincoln was making this offhanded remark, well, you know, we should, I believe in all men should vote, <laughs> even women. I mean, was he joking? I. I, I don't know, but I continue. I think he was serious. I think why not? I, I, I that's um, where I'm putting um, my decision that he actually meant when he said not excluding females. Uh, I, we have a question here that I'm going to go it's toward the end of where I was uh, because I wanted to ask about uh, Mary and because she was there and with many of Lincoln's deaths and too. She was. And. Uh, I think I, I'm giving her a much more uh, viability as a person. Yes. And we have to have more understanding of her yeah. uh, as well. She, for heaven's sakes, she washed Willie's body. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. she didn't go to the funeral. Right. And th people said she was hysterical or would right. become hysterical. Right. But today, which one of us are going to Mm. wash our dead child's mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Dave Wiggers, thank you, Dave. Uh, Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> How did Mary Lincoln's reaction to death compare to Lincoln? Oh, that's a great question, Dave. I mean, Dave's a good friend, so thank we you. We all know question, him. Dave. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, in this book, I really saw myself as rehabilitating Mary's reputation, at least a mm. little bit. Um, because I've seen way too many um, biographies that sort of read her problems after Lincoln's death backwards and presume that she was doing the same sorts of unstable things when 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 Willie died and even when Eddie died. I mean, I've seen I've seen arguments that she was quote losing it when Eddie died. There's no evidence of this. Um, no, she did not go to Eddie's funeral or Willie's funeral, but it was common practice in the day that women didn't attend funerals because it was believed they couldn't control their emotions. She wasn't breaking societal norms by not attending. As a matter of fact, she was obeying societal norms. And even though there's abundant evidence that Willie's death shattered her in 1862, she kept it very private. If you go digging through the newspaper accounts of Willie's death, nobody is saying, oh, by the way, the first lady's losing her mind. She's not. Um, now, 
behind the scenes, she was having all kinds of problems, and we all know that, but she kept a careful public facade of obeying the rules that you do in the, in the rules of mourning. So I, I, see, I see relatively little difference between Mary and Abe there. They are both, a, they're following the rules, and she does this at least all the way until when, when Lincoln dies. And so um, to follow up that, was it probably common practice for her to have, like in society, to have seances like that she did in the White House, or was that the, something that was? The seances are old. I got that one got interesting. Um, I know for a fact that she did attend one seance in the soldier's home that was held by a huckster named uh, uh, Charles Colchester. And I got the whole story. It's really interesting stuff. Um, we also know that she attended at least one seance in the home of the Lauries, who were a prominent spiritualist family in Washington, D.C. Beyond that, there's no hard evidence of anything other than those two things. Okay. You can get on the internet today and find all kinds of websites claiming that both the Lincolns attended a dozen seances and the pianos levitated in the West Wing, all that. I've drilled down to the sources. The sources come from two places. Anti-Lincoln Democratic newspapers are going to publish any bloody thing they can find on Lincoln to discredit him. And spiritualists themselves, who are desperate to have Lincoln be one of their own, if you if you discard those sources, there's almost nothing that suggests that she went to maybe two seances. Now, after the, the, the assassination, then she's becoming very interested. And there's the Lumler picture of Lincoln and all that. But during the war, those are the only two I know of. There could have been more, but you can't find hard evidence of just those two. And there's no evidence that Lincoln ever attended a seance. Wow. Okay. Now, you write of studies, modern studies, mm -hmm. on death's impact on, uh, on children. Right, right. Both lost their mothers right. early on. Both Mary and Abraham lost their mothers early on. Did this affect them in a similar manner? Hmm. And can we extrapolate today's studies back to them? That's a great question. First all of all, nice. all, all <laughs> of your questions. questions are awesome, man. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay. No, no. Um, first of all, this is going back to the very beginning of our conversation. This is where I had to, I thought, carefully apply some modern psychological theory um, because we have so little data and information. I needed to say something about how a young Abraham Lincoln would react to his mother's death. Mm -hmm. And there's almost no good primary sources on this. I mean, so I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go look at the literature that we have on modern children and how they react to the loss of a parent and, and, and carefully say, okay, here's how children tend to react. And I hope I did this in a light way, not saying I know for sure how Lincoln reacted because I don't. But um, that's an interesting question about comparing the two. I think the contexts are so radically different. Um, uh, Mary, Mary's mother passes away, but then she's raised, and then but she doesn't get along with her stepmother at all. And then she's Mary's more or less raised by an African American woman named Mammy Sally in the in, in the in the household. Lincoln, on the other hand, has a great relationship with his stepmother and has no such relationship. But you'd want to be careful comparing those two things because yeah. I just think they were radically different contexts. But yeah. over over time. They, they, it they certainly had yeah. to. Oh, I think it probably had an there. effect. I, I get that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I have here party hack. <laughs> All right. So Lincoln certainly involved himself in precinct politics in those days. You know, it was a rough and dirty environment, and you call some of his actions reckless at times, yeah. uh, especially with anonymous newspaper articles uh, that led to other things. So tell us of the partisan side of Lincoln. Was he particularly aggressive? Uh, how did he get the moniker Samson's ghost? You're up. <laughs> so um, the expectation is, I think, in, in that particular time period that partisanship is the nature. So when the, uh, the, and it's interesting because he comes at a particular time period when political parties are just beginning to form. I mean, the Jackson era uh, and the crushing of the National Bank and his opposition to Henry Clay, as we right, talked right. about, and, and the, the Whig Party forming and all of these sort of things, and, and Jackson being very, very popular in Illinois, uh, and the Democratic Party being very popular in Illinois, and Lincoln basically being a Whig, which, was, is, uh, is, uh, which is one of the reasons why he he was in the minority party because the Democrats were popular in Illinois. So it, it became very much hardened very, very fast. Um, by the time you were first read in 1832, I really don't say there was much of a real party structure. By 1834, there is. Mm. Uh, and by 1836, we're seeing people who don't vote for Lincoln anymore because he's a Whig mm. and they were Democrats. Mm. Uh, so I think it's the rough and tumble age of frontier politics. Um, and how, you know, when you go to, when you're campaigning for office, anything can happen. You know, there can be fights that would break out, and Lincoln knows he has to appeal to these particular types of audiences in the frontier. 
who actually want those kind of things. So what he did was reckless, but I kind of understand because it was almost sort of the un, um, it was sort of the expectation that this is what politics is about. Um, how did the Rebecca letter change? Well, um, see, and the thing is, is that I think that that changed because of the duel that almost happened after the with James Shields. But that's the thing is, is it, oftentimes he uh, with with James Shields is when he wrote these letters, he, he was attacking Shields' manhood, um, and that's where I say some of these things were reckless. Uh, even Peter Cartwright, who becomes the wrath mm. of, of Lincoln's one of his first times he ever has an anonymous attack, which is not so anonymous, to be honest, um, was pretty vicious. Um, and again, I think Lincoln began to temper that. So, but one thing I think comes out of this that I guess I came away being impressed with because I speak all the time in my classes about civility is necessary in politics. And we need to return to the example of Lincoln. And part of me thinks, really, civility? <laughs> but Lincoln found a way to apologize. And, mm -hmm. and almost every instance, almost every instance I can find where he made these personal attacks, he apologized. Mm -hmm. One in particular, if I could uh, have time to say it. Uh, my favorite instance of this was when he was in Lawrence County in 1840 campaigning for William Henry Harrison. And uh, there's a man named William uh, Armstrong who writes a letter after this to Lincoln basically saying, your words insulted me. Just let me know, did you really mean this? And Lincoln was, I think, just aghast at what he did. He said, he wrote back saying, I, I, my words meant no insult, please forgive me, uh, and, and I did not mean to insult you. And so I think he understood that sometimes the things he did, the, just, the skinning of Jesse Thomas, a lot more in there. Read the, read the book, yeah, buy the book. Exactly. Yes. A lot of this in there. Yes. If you have any other questions, this is your time to do it, by the way. But, I, but also to order these two fine books, there's so much in there. You're just getting parts of it here, and I find it fascinating. I, I'm going to have to go back and read them again because of this, I think. You talked about the uh, log rolling with the, with the Sangamon group uh, trying to get uh, Springfield as, the, as a new capital versus, of course, internal improvements, which is what mainly most politicians wanted, most of the populace of Illinois wanted. Mm -hmm. So just how much log rolling did he really have to do? I don't care what he said about, oh, I went as far as I could. But he was going to, they were going to vote for him anyway because they wanted imp improvements anyway. So I'm asking, was he feigning deniability in that regard? And uh, what Lord Lamon, his friend, said that he could stretch the truth when necessary. Mm -hmm. Oh, he had a thirst for ambition. He really, really did. Uh, you're right, uh, that there was a fever pitch. Illinois, I have to contend, I mean, the, the book to me is fascinating because Illinois and Lincoln were both, for, they were reaching a very, very formative years. Uh, Illinois was the, one of the fastest growing states, if not the fastest growing state in the country. It was the place to be. And so it's many how Link, Illinois was developing, the frontier was developing into this state that we wanted to be like. And of course, Lincoln called himself the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois, or he wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois after Governor DeWitt Clinton, who brought Erie Canal to New York. And so I think he wanted to stop at nothing. So there was certainly this impulse in Lincoln from the very first start, where he talks about internal improvements from the very end, even when the Panic of 1837 hit and everybody He's like, no, pull it back. Lincoln's like, no, no, go, 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 go. So you're right. By 1836, many people in Illinois were wanting the internal improvements, the ridges, the roads, the bridges, the canals. Um, and certainly he wasn't alone in that. But again, he had to make some, he had to make some deals to get that capital moved uh, from Southern Illinois and to, to um, Springfield. And make no mistake, there were people who would write uh, that, you know, we did this because of Lincoln. We did this because of Lincoln's persuasion. And even fellow um, Representative Robert Wilson uh, in Sangamon County writes that uh, the whole state was bought up. I mean, you know, I, I kept thinking when I was reading that chapter, that portion of your book, uh, log rolling and Vote, uh, votes going back and forth, which politicians do. You got to do I, that. It's the game of politics. Today, it's the game back of politics. Got to yes. be done. It's the game of politics. <clears throat> and I was thinking of him sitting in Springfield dur during the wigwam time oh. and saying, "No, don't uh, make any deals." Me. And of yeah, course, yeah. Davis and Sweat and Judd sure, were, sure. They were making sure. deals. They had to make deals. Sure, absolutely. And uh, absolutely. he had deniability. See, I, th I, I think he used that. Oh, he did. Because he, he knew it had to happen. Yeah, you did. So. Yes. Um, he was the chief of the long nine. 
Um, he yeah, and now, he was how did he that. become chief of the? Well, he he was uh, he he was the one who was there before many of them came in because again he was elected in 1834 and many of them were elected in 1836. Uh -huh. They sort of naturally looked to Abraham Lincoln. I think he had this leadership quality about them. Uh -huh. He was able to corral them again as Whig floor leader. So I think he had this natural ability to rise. And again, people outside of Sangamon County recognize that. And the Sangamon Journal even called him the chief of the Long Nine tribe. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, now, Lincoln is president. He signed, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, easily 20,000 right. military commissions, sending them off to death. And what did he think about giving signature after signature after signature after signature, especially after Willie died, uh, and after Baker and Ellsworth were gone? And here he was. He knew them personally, he didn't know them, but he was sending them off to be maimed. He knew that. And yet, I'm going to conflate two questions. Uh, Lincoln, as a pardoner, he only had 353 military pardons during the war, opposed to 3,000 during FDR, during World War II. Uh, but he's become known as the great pardoner. 353 seems low. Was he less troubled sending men off to war uh, than maybe others? Or I'm not sure how to pray, phrase that. There's the arc of his development, and I always emphasize with Lincoln, I'm sure you'd agree, that he learns, he grows, he becomes something different over time. In the early stages of the war, like everybody else in America, he was stunned by the level of death and the casualties. And then on top of that, I think Lincoln personally got distracted by the deaths of Elmer Ellsworth, of Edward Baker, and then of course of Willie Lincoln. And if you look at the early parts of the war, Lincoln doesn't do much to, to frankly, to lead the American people. There's very little in his early speeches as president through about 1862 in which he says, okay, America, this is why they died. This is the meaning of the death. He just, he, and, and this is partially because of the infancy of the presidency, which had not really been designed to do that. But then as the war continues, I argue, especially after Antietam, he, he simply grows harder. He makes his peace with the idea that this is going to require quite a few dead bodies. I think he makes his peace with that because he is understanding of finally the level of death and suffering this is going to take. But then he also introduces emancipation, which is a greater moral imperative to push him towards saying there's going to be cost and sacrifice here. There's a development in him. So I would, I would argue that yes, he did pardon soldiers. I think he cultivated that image because it's useful to him politically. But on the other hand, you know, we praise Lincoln for pushing Grant to fight, for pushing McClellan to fight. But he knew at the time, as he pushed them, more men would die. And I think he had simply made his peace that this is something that is going to need to happen because this is a revolution. Well, just like the war, he was ready for the war to come. Yeah. He felt that slavery would be mm -hmm. taken away, really, mm -hmm. by war. It's the only way. Absolutely. You know, even though we all think it's from time. No, he really felt it from oh, George yeah, Robertson. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's the same thing here. Better now, yeah. let him die now so yeah. more don't die yeah. later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. Of course, he had to write a couple of letters on death. He did. The McCulloch, Fanny McCulloch letter. Fanny McCulloch letter. And of course, the Bixby letter. If he wrote it. If he wrote it, or if he wrote it, or <laughs> yes, whatever. Yes, but absolutely. a movie came from that. Yeah, it did. So it there did. you go. I've gotten that question. Uh, so what was that? How do the two of you, as Lincoln historians, view those two letters? Well, um, you're more the expert of this, but I like the Fanny letter. It's always been mm -hmm. one of my favorites. I just think there's a personal sense about it. Yeah. Um, honestly, when it comes to death, if I can change your question a little bit, my favorite was always been the letter that he writes to uh, Elmer Ellsworth's parents. Oh, I, yes, that's I a good one. I love yeah. that one yes, because he really yes. talks about the humanity of what Elmer Ellsworth meant, and, yeah, and, and yeah. It, it, it's so beautiful and so yeah. eloquent. Well, he knew him, that helped. Yeah, that, that helped greatly. But uh, so uh, I'm going to pass on that because I agree. I, I think the Bixby letter, I don't, I agree. I'm, I'm kind of in the hay camp yeah. myself. I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Michael Burlingame that he did not write that letter. Yeah, okay. okay. But what I, what I, what I, you'll be absolutely, but what I do believe is as the war continues, he learns subtle, low key ways to communicate his understanding of, of the nation's suffering. And I think the Bixby letter, I think, is a fine example of that. Even if he didn't write it, 
um, he allowed it to be disseminated um, under, his under his name. And um, the the, fa the the Fannie McCall letters and the Ellsworth letters are earlier in the war, and they are also True. much more personal because he knew Fannie McCall's father, who was a clerk in the court right, system. Right, so there's a personal right. connection that. there. But he has these subtle little ways of saying to the country. I understand your suffering even if I'm not going to break down crying in front of you. And I think you learned how to do that. Good. Good did watch. each of you read Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders? I actually have not yet. Yeah, on my I was going to ask you how yeah. you felt. Well, I'm going to ask you, how, how did he, he portrayed Lincoln there. Mm, he did. He how did. did you feel about his portrayal of Lincoln I at Willie's grave? I actually argue against it in the introduction to my book. I say we always want the haunted Lincoln. We think Lincoln is haunted by death, and in Lincoln and the Bardo, he's haunted by the dying. I think that that's maybe over-exaggerated. I think he came to make his peace with death, and I think he learned to understand that death had to be used to win the war without having a psychological breakdown, which is fairly close to what is argued in that novel. Of course, there he was allowed to be in, in the Bardo book. He was allowed to be himself, away from everyone, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and goes back to the White House, and he's, he's okay. So exactly. Exactly. just like Mary exactly. kept herself upstairs and allowed herself to exactly. Exactly. grieve the way she did, exactly. maybe in the Bardo is a way that he privately did that we didn't know, and that's yeah, how a novelist awesome. came to it. Well, a novelist can make those speculations. Exactly, yeah. story I thought it was very moving. <laughs> I love the book. I love the book, <laughs> yeah. but it's not something I think is useful for understanding Lincoln as an historian. No, I understand. I agree with you on that. That's a darn fun. So <laughs> why did he leave the legislature? I mean, he was having such fun. Um, well, again, <laughs> the fact is, again, uh, as I keep going back to the Whig parties and the minority party, you always want your party to be in lead so you can control legislation. Uh, that was part of it. But the, part of, the second part is I think he knew that his legislative career was over. He wanted to run for higher office. Um, in 1832, that was pretty much the only thing he could run for. Uh, by 1840, uh, he was a different man, and I think he had positioned himself. Um, he was the leading Whig in the state, by some people's views. He wanted to run for the United States Senate. I think it was pretty obvious that's one of the, uh, the, race, the offices he always wanted. Obviously, he would go to Congress first for two years, uh, U.S. House of Representatives, but ultimately Senate. Um, but in fact, he was elected to the Senate in the 1850s and refused to, to serve because he wanted to run for the United States Senate. Greener pastures. That's all we, it's always, always. Did he been. himself look back on those years and reminisce and say anything about it? You know, we don't know much. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, which is what um, I think that Lincoln is one of the reasons why Lincoln in the legislature is overlooked is because Lincoln overlooked it himself. I mean, mm -hmm. his autobiographies, he doesn't mm -hmm. talk much about it. And it's like, I kind of wish Lincoln would have. And so mm -hmm. he didn't really talk too much about that. I'm sure he did to some of the people that he would see, maybe fellow legislators, probably even Stephen Douglas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Usher Linder, all these people that they probably would reminisce about the days of the legislature, but he didn't talk about it much. But he moved on from many of those friends anyway, didn't he? Well, he did, you know. Um, that was one of the one of the things that many friends said that he, 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 did. he, he didn't say they were used, mm -hmm. but he also said that, you know, he moved on. And, and I do mm -hmm. grapple with that in the book. I'd say, I say Lincoln was a person who, uh, yeah, I mean, he had it, he had people who uh, opposed him. Mm -hmm. Well, I've enjoyed this immensely. Oh, me too. This, uh, it's great. Fascinating. Mainly because I've read these two books as well. So I, I, I had even more in my mind when they, we were all talking. And you will, too. These are terrific books. The Concise Lincoln Library, first of all, is one that everyone should have so you can pass on different aspects of Lincoln to the younger generations. I think that's really important to do. So University, uh, Southern Illinois University Press is doing a wonderful job. Yeah. And yours, even though it's not in the concise, it's concise enough for anyone to read. So Lincoln in the legislature, Southern Illinois University Press, 160 pages, 24.95. I recommend this to you highly as I do for all, actually all of the ones in that, in that series. The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death, you're not going to get it anywhere else. <laughs> and this is one that will be very provocative for you, something you'll want to then maybe go into Lincoln's writings, like the Elmer's, uh, Ellsworth letter, and see it. So you have that as well. So thank you again. Uh, watch uh, your emails. We'll be getting it out for next year's uh, House Divided. We don't have any to tell you of right this moment, but they will be coming. So we want you to be with us and not miss them and uh, get those books on your shelves because I think they will be, hopefully they will have important ones for you. Thank you to the staff of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop who put on a house divided for us all. We thank you who have asked questions. 
We look forward to all of you the next time. Thank you for watching.